the coin of tribute. What does it mean to pay tribute, to be a tribute? Well, a tribute comes from the word tributary, and if you took science class in high school, a tributary is a river or stream that flows into a larger river or lake. That's what it means to be a tributary. So the idea or the understanding, Jesus said, show me the tribute money. Israel at the time was a tributary. It was a stream that flowed in to the Roman Empire. It was a time of empire in the world. And th that was the world of their day. Empires govern lands. And then those lands send back, give back tribute, like small streams flow from watersheds into a larger ri river which gathers the flows of many of uh, waters, many tributaries, and are carried into the sea. That's the picture. So the nations were tributaries to imperial Rome, and they, f they had to give back, as it were, unto them tribute, unto Caesar and his appointees. So if we, if we understand that, that's what we're talking about. Now Jesus' point was in regard to the poll tax. We explained the poll tax this morning. Every Jewish male was required once a year to pay the poll tax, be like a quarter a day's pay. A silver quarter, if you had in your hand today, uh, would be worth about $5. And if you can go back to the turn of the century when we were on a more of a, a gold standard in our economy, you know, Henry Ford did the $3, you know, work day. Um, so you, you would be talking about, you know, a day's pay, a day and a half's pay, two days pay as a, if you will, income tax or land tax in some provinces, it depended, that you had to give back to the provincial government. Now, if we think about this, you know, whether the Pharisees cared to admit it or not, they were governed, occupied, and secured by Rome, and thus Rome should expect to receive tribute. However, Jesus so adeptly mentions the Roman ruler must be careful not to take credit for that which is of God, to venerate or glorify himself above his own measure. And no Jew, whether they were a Herodian or a Pharisee or whatever their position was on this, could disagree with what Jesus said. Yeah, that emperor is going too far. <laughs> He's going way too far by printing his image on the coin and putting above it in the inscription, Son of the Divine, and on the back, High Priest. He's gone too far in that. And Jesus definitely mentioned that's God's area, arena, that's not his. But yes, for the security and the governance of the empire, uh, one must give back to him. But at the same time, he's blasphemous, and that's really between him and God. Uh, but he is blasphemous. Outside the domain of the religious leaders, they're not going to censure Caesar, all right? He's, he's not a Jew, nor is he under their domain. But this money was needed to be returned in due proportion to conduct the business of empire. So Jesus handled it. Said another way, Caesar printed the coin himself. Okay, so now we're getting into the object lesson. These coins were minted, printed in Rome, the city. And there, Caesar printed the coin himself and placed his own image on it. And then he distributed it to his soldiers, one a day as payment for their service, to builders as payment to construct the aqueducts and, and improvements of the Roman Empire. And then it was circulated from there as they had these coins, they would then trade on them. And no doubt there were centurions in Jerusalem that had this coin and collected it and went in and paid for lodging, paid for goods, paid for other things, and it became the currency of the realm, which no one uh, could deny. Well, coins, after they, and, and currency and money, after it serves its purpose, uh, it circulates and circulates, and then it goes out of circulation. Now, what serves as a parallel to this in the spiritual realm? So that's where I'm going with this lesson. We understand the king printed the coin. He put his image on it. He circulates it. It goes throughout 
and it comes back to him. Um, and eventually, like all money that goes out into circulation, it circulates for a long time, but then at a certain time it goes out of circulation. So what's an what's a apt parallel in the spiritual realm? Because what we're having here is two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of Caesar, all right? This is here. Money goes out, pays the soldiers, pays the improvements. Money comes back, returns to where it came from. As a tributary, it flows back. That's Caesar's kingdom. He has no right on being divine, nor does he have any right to worship, to receive worship. But there's another kingdom here. There's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. There's the kingdom of God. Now, that kingdom is a kingdom of souls. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a kingdom that's not of this world as Jesus described. His kingdom is a kingdom that's a spiritual kingdom, the reign of God over souls. The kingdom of God grows one soul at a time. So I think that when we say render or give back unto God the things that are God's, the first thing that comes to my mind is our souls, the souls of men. Think about it. Souls, you know, start out, are put into circulation in the world for a while. While they're here, they do both good and bad, a lot like money. At some point, they go out of circulation for good, out of this world. The human soul, if you turn with me to Genesis 2, and I'm just going to teach a lesson on the human soul, seeing it in light of this passage of the kingdom of God, Jesus saying, render unto God the things that are God's. Give back to God the things that are God's. Genesis 2, 7. So it's going to be a lesson tonight about who we are and what we are, where we came from and where we're going. Genesis 2.7 says, and I'll give you a moment to get there, and the Lord God, in Genesis 2.7, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and, the man, and man became a living soul. So at the beginning, just like the parallel with the coin, the human soul is embodied and becomes a physical entity when God breathes into it. It's a combination. Our life is both material and immaterial, physical and spiritual. At least you can divide it in those two ways. And at the very start, when God put us and put the man in circulation, he breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. He was, in a sense, coined that way. Now, the physical coin, as it was with Caesar, is stamped with the image of its maker. Just as Rome coined its own money and stamped on the coin the image of its maker, so God says this, and you can just turn back one page, not even in my Bible, it's the same page, to Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we are, as currency, as coinage, as God's creation breathed into us, the breath of life, a living soul, created in God's image. And that makes us unique. We were made in God's image, especially to bring uh, a special honor and glory to the earth. To be God's image bearer, 
to circulate, as it were, the image of God throughout the earth through being fruitful and multiplying and subduing and having dominion over the earth. We were made to rule, made to reign, made uh, to spread the rule of God over the earth. Now this tells us something right away that puts us in great conflict with what the world teaches. So the Bible teaches that man is a living soul, both material and immaterial, made and stamped, if you will, to go with what I'm saying tonight, in the image of God. The world doesn't teach that. The world teaches that we came from nothing which is impossible, but it teaches that we are biological, that we arose from chemicals and, and you know, are a collocation of random atoms, fizzing like soda pop. That's what the world says. They don't have any account for the immaterial part of us. They don't know what life is. They don't know what death is. They don't understand that life, it was the entrance of God's breath, making us a soul, both material and immaterial, stamping us with the image of God. They don't accept that because they think we're animals. See, what makes us different than the animal kingdom is that we are of a completely different order. The Bible never says that man's an animal. Man is not part of the animal kingdom. He's not at the top of the animal kingdom. He is made distinctly in the image of God, to portray to the animal kingdom God, all right? Not that we are gods, but we were his image bearer in the world. So we did not arise from biological processes. We're more, infinitely more complex and capable than the animals. You don't see the animals organizing to do things. You don't see, um, all the things that we have, like government and morality, none of these things. These are God's image upon us. But as we move forward, the idea, as I said, is to render unto God the things that are God's. So what about the soul? Is it ours? Is it ours, really? Well, let me have you turn to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Is it really ours to keep? The Old Testament says a lot about the soul, about the immaterial part of man. And if you turn to the prophet Ezekiel, which is before Daniel, and turn to Ezekiel 18, we learn a lesson about the soul of man. And that is that the soul of man is distinct. Every person is a distinct soul. We don't, um, each person is distinct. Our souls are distinct, but are, we are accountable for our soul to God. God owns the souls. 18.4 says, behold, all souls are mine. So that establishes the fact that God breathed life into Adam, and that life, as Adam had children, that those children were distinct. It says, behold, all, the, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. Okay? So Adam's son was a distinct and living soul, accountable for God, to God, and the soul is God's. It's not ours. Keep you can't hang on to it. It's not ours. It goes back. It's God's. Now, of that soul that we have, what are we accountable to God for? When God says, all souls are mine, he's saying, I'm going to make a claim someday. I'm going to settle it, the matter. Your soul is mine. You're accountable to me for your soul. And what are you accountable for? Well, it says it right here at the end of verse 4. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You're accountable, your soul, your ever-living soul, 
which, unlike your body, never dies, is accountable to God for sin. For sin. See, if we go with, the, again, the example of money, when that money is printed, it's new and it's fresh. Ever get some fresh money? You like that? My mom worked at a bank for years. That fresh money, it has a smell to it. It's, it's brand new. It's crisp. Okay? That's all we were. Okay? When, when, when Adam was created and Eve. They were crisp and perfect $1 bills, if you will. Stamped in the image of God. Material, but yet unique. Just like every dollar bill that, that we have is unique. It's uniquely denominated in the currency. And so every soul is unique. We saw that. But the problem is, once you get a dollar in circulation for a while, it's dirty, filthy, worn out. It begins to not be crisp and clean. And so the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It cannot go back to God like that. You know, if you have kids, you always tell the kids, don't put that money in your mouth. That money's, that money's bad. It's nasty. It's filthy. It's disgusting. Folks, that's us. The sin has corrupted, desecrated the image. We know that that's illegal, right? When you're a kid, somebody probably took a dollar bill and said, I'm going to write on it. You can't do that. That's against the law. But people do it, and they write silly things and desecrate the image on the dollar bill. It's wrong, uh, but it's done. And so a sin desecrates this image of God and us, mars us. Yes, we are still stamped in his image, but we're marred, filthy, dirty, unfit to go back. To learn a little bit more about the soul, we'll continue in the Old Testament to turn back a little bit to Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes in our lesson tonight about the soul. See, the great fallacy, and Ecclesiastes is a wonderful book, book I've taught and love greatly, but it gives a certain viewpoint to the common man, if you will, under the sun, explaining some of these things to him. Something that we are deceived by is that we hold our soul. We, we hold it. We own it. It's ours. But we cannot hold on to our soul forever. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 8 says, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. In other words, we do not have the power over death. We do not have the power to retain our soul. Our soul is going back. It's going back. We can't hold on to it. We have for a time, we're embodied. For a time, we're, a, we're on this earth. We're in, if you will, circulation. But we cannot hold on forever power over our life, over our soul. At the end of Ecclesiastes, I believe Solomon presents a certain kind of repentance. And you can turn a few pages to 12 where you could say he comes out of the darkness and into the light and looks at things uh, from more of a godly perspective. And in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, he says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. That's what I'm talking about. There's a time coming where you can't hold on to this life any longer. It will end. And at that point, your body will go back to where it came from, which is the ground, to the dust. Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And I imagine that's what happens with our dollar bills. At a certain point in time, they're taken out of circulation, and I, I imagine they're probably incinerated. They're, they're turned to ash. They're no longer... Or 
coin would be found, you know, refounded and, 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 and melted, reformed. But it's out of circulation, and there's a time we are going to go through that. We're going to die, and our material part is going back to the dirt from whence it came. But our spiritual part is going to be called to account. God is going to call the account of our ever-living soul. We have no power over when this time happens. In Hebrews 9.24, it says, It is appointed unto man uh, once to die, and after this, the judgment. Every man has this appointment. We just don't know when it is. But we are appointed once to die. Not twice. There's no reincarnation to the Hindu man. You don't get nine tries at it like a cat. Okay? That's not how it works. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. You're called to account for your soul. And he's going to call us someday. And this is very richly put forth in the parable of the barn builder. Look with me in Luke 12, 16. It's a very interesting parable where a man in the story Jesus gives, has a conversation with his own soul. And that's one reason why we're humans are in the image of God. One of the distinct things about us is that we can talk to ourselves, that we're sentient, okay? That you can have a full-on conversation with yourself. You are self-aware, okay? Animals are not that way. The other night, my dog was barking in the middle of the night, and we were irritated, and we saw he was looking in the mirror. He was barking at the dog in the mirror. He'll never be smart enough to understand that that is himself. Okay? To him, that's always going to be another dog because he doesn't understand. He's not having um, made in the image and likeness of God to where he understands that he is... Um, a soul, because he's not, in the same way that man is, and that, that he has self-awareness. He lacks that, but, but men have self-awareness. And so here we have an example of this sentient self-awareness that God has given unto man because a man has a conversation with himself. Jesus here in verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul. <laughs> Gotta love that. Soul. Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So we have insight in this person who spoke to his own soul and said, Hey, let's take a break. Life is about pleasure. Life is about enjoyment. Life is about pleasing myself. And his soul said, yeah, let's do it. And God said, thou fool. You don't realize it, but you're about to have a heart attack in the middle of the night. You're about to die. And your soul isn't going to get to enjoy all that you made. It's not going to get to enjoy those barns of plenty. It's not going to eat and drink and be merry. Rather, it's going to go back. It's going to be rendered, called to account. And we cannot come back to God marred, disfigured, and dirty, having desecrated his image and his moral likeness. We're not going to get back into the kingdom of God as we are. So what's the hope for a coin, like they say, a bad penny, <laughs> that gets tossed around? What's the hope for us? 
It's the gospel. Look with me at the gospel as Peter declares it in 1 Peter chapter 2. The answer is, and simply, we need to be bought back. There's a price that only God can pay to buy our souls back. And this price is given in the gospel. And of course, it's Jesus. That's the price. See, Jesus was printed, if you will, in the form of sinful flesh. He knew no sin, but he was printed and coined in the form that we all exist in as a person, as a human being. He walked this earth, yet he knew no sin. He was a perfect image of the Father. And God spent him to buy us, the just for the unjust. Look at the gospel as we see it. And we, we see it in Christ. Verse 21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins. He was that perfect, fresh, crisp dollar bill. And on him was laid the iniquity of us all. On him, the disgusting filth that we have accumulated was placed on him as if he had committed it. On him, on the tree, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. back to God through the gospel. Through the exchange of our filth, God buys us back. And like a silver coin, polishes us, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Who were stamped originally in the image of God, but now there's nothing that's a more perfect mirror than polished silver. And you think about the coin that once was marred and tarred and stained and desecrated, which was us, God cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and like a mirror, a pure, fine silver, we now reflect the image of God in Jesus Christ. See, now we were created in the image of God. This is true. But now... As, as, as being given back to God, bought back, as it were, to God, brought back into the kingdom of God, into the citizenship of the realm of God, into circulation, we now can reflect unto him the image which the New Testament explains to us that he, Jesus Christ, is the express image of God. And we when we behold him, are transformed into that image and into that likeness, to the likeness of the only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. What a wonder. Returned, bought back, brought back to the shepherd and bishop of our souls, presented faultless unto God the Father in the kingdom. 
when he delivers up all in all, as it says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, unto the Father, the kingdom, souls. Souls that were stained, but now are as pure as polished silver. Back to usefulness. Back to God. So what do we owe to God? What do we render to him? Everything. Our souls. To love him with all our heart, all our mind, and all our souls for what he's done for us in the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonder of the gospel that God would deign to grab filthy sinners, even as it says in Jude, hating even the garment spotted with the flesh. If by any means he might save some. We thank you, we thank you, Father, for the salvation of our own soul, if we have, in fact, given ourselves unto thee. If there's anyone here tonight that's not saved, that has not believed the gospel, has not um, surrendered unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray you'd work in hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.